I think the world heaved a sigh of relief. A gasp went up if you were in the universe, I think, that day. The brick wall that so many people felt they were hitting their heads against became a door. The door opened a crack. The question was, would it be kicked open or slammed shut? In these last four years, has it been kicked open? What happened to the movements, all of these incredibly proud, important movements that make this country great? What did they do after President Obama was elected? For one thing, I think they were in shock that they accomplished what they accomplished. They were in awe and people were exhausted. And they also didn't want to contribute to a right-wing backlash. The birther movement, for example, such a terribly racist movement saying Barack Obama could not possibly be from this country. He is the other. And no one wanted to contribute to that. But what happened as a result? One of the first acts of President Obama, because he was elected, among others, by the human rights community, was saying, we're closing Guantanamo within a year. A cheer went up around the country, around the globe, that this country would stand up for human rights. Has it been closed? No. President Obama has presided over the longest war in U.S. history in Afghanistan, and he's expanded the drone wars. We're talking about thousands of people have been killed by drones, undeclared wars in Yemen, in Somalia, in Pakistan. I really encourage people to read the Stanford University Law School report done together with New York University Law School called Living Under Drones, done by law professors on both coasts went to Pakistan and talked to the people there. It is not only the horrific deaths that are taking place. I think they say 2% of the deaths are supposedly high-value targets. So what does that mean about the other 98% of people were killed? It's not only the deaths. The fabric of their society is being ripped apart. People are afraid to go out to their local gerbils where they solve conflict, to have their kids go to school. They're afraid of these drones and their hellfire missiles randomly striking their communities. How is this taking place under the president elected by the peace movement in this country? And then there's the issue of the environment. You know, Democracy Now! is there at all the UN climate change summits in Copenhagen, in Cancun, in Durban, South Africa, as well in Bolivia for the People's Summit. Yay! In Copenhagen, we saw President Obama fly in at the last minute, scuttling any meaningful, comprehensive climate change agreement that would lead to real greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Yet environmentalists were key in electing him. And now we've seen these horrific weather catastrophes. You know, it has been amazing living on the East Coast, going through the superstorm, which, you know, made Democracy Now! like so many other places in New York, we operated under blackout conditions for that week. No electricity. And then, for the terrible, for those who were suffering for weeks without electricity in the Rockaways and Staten Island and New Jersey, being hit on top of that by the Northeastern. Some, their electricity went on for a few hours and then knocked right out. I remember watching MSNBC just a few days ago after the Northeaster, and he said, it's just incredible. We have these, you know, storms we're not supposed to have once in a century, and now they're coming one by one. He says, these climate events make you scratch your head. Make you scratch your head. Why, when they talk about global warming, why, when they talk about extreme weather, severe weather, can't these meteorologists talk about climate change? Why can't they put together those other two words?
global warming, global disruption. Yes, millions of people may have been powerless. No electricity through the superstorm, but we are not powerless to do something about climate change. We must demand of the corporate media who are using our airwaves. It's not their private property. These are a national treasure. These are the public airwaves. We must demand that they make that connection. Now, I thought there would be a break in this, that we are coming to a turning point, and I think we have to a certain extent, with Mayor Bloomberg announcing not so much his support for President Obama, but because of climate change, he said. And then, of course, because he is a major media mogul, owns Bloomberg Business Week and so many other media, the cover of Bloomberg Business Week, it's global warming, stupid. That week of, of the Superstorm Sand. This is critical. You know on Democracy Now! day after day, we deal with this issue of climate change. Not only during the Superstorm, every single day, but before it as well. And one of the people we interviewed was Dr. Jeff Masters, who founded the weather blog, Weather Underground. As Sandy bore down on the East Coast, I asked Jeff Masters what impact climate change is having on hurricanes. He said, whenever you add more heat to the oceans, you've got more energy for destruction. Hurricanes pull heat out of the ocean, convert it to the kinetic energy of their winds. Master's blog has become so popular, it was just bought by the Weather Channel. As Sandy moved up the coast, he continued with our interview. He said, when you do heat the oceans up more, you extend the length of hurricane season. There's been ample evidence over the last decade or so that hurricane season's getting longer, starting earlier, ending later. You're more likely to have this sort of situation where a late October storm meets up with a regular winter low pressure system and gives us this ridiculous combination of a nor'easter and a hurricane that comes ashore bringing all kinds of destructive effects. And you think of what Mitt Romney, a name that probably won't be remembered for too much longer. Uh -huh. But what Mitt Romney said at the Republican convention when he said, President Obama promised to slow the rise of the oceans and to heal the planet. My promise is to help you and your family. What happens when those two issues coincide? When stopping the rising of the seas means helping you and your family? Romney drew a big laugh from those gathered to nominate him. But no one is laughing now. When you look at the effects of just Superstorm Sandy, to name one, more than 100 people killed in the United States. In Haiti, it was devastated. Eight million people without power, tens of billions of dollars, destruction. But this doesn't let President Obama off the hook. Recall the presidential debates where he continually boasted of his fossil fuel credentials. President Obama said oil production is up, natural gas production is up. This he said at Hofstra, the second presidential debate. He said, I'm all for pipelines, I'm all for oil production. In none of the three presidential debates did the presidential candidates, the major party presidential candidates, Mitt Romney and President Obama, or the news anchors that moderated those debates, did they raise the issue of climate change. We have to challenge the media because it's the way we come to understand the world. How do we learn about the world? Through our family, friends, teachers, but mostly we learn about the rest of the world through the media. And it has to be through something other than a corporate lens. When we're covering war, we need to learn the information to make decisions. We need to watch a media not brought to you by the weapons manufacturers. When we're covering climate change, we need a media not 
brought to you by the oil, the gas, the coal, the nuclear companies. When we're covering health care, we need a media not brought to you by the insurance industry, by big pharma, by the drug companies. We need a media that's brought to you by listeners and viewers like you, which is why it's so important that you always support KPFA, your Pacifica station, right here in the world. And I'm honored that Link TV is here, based here in San Francisco, independent television on Dish Network Channel 9410 and on Direct TV Channel 9375. And also KRCB, PBS, you know Democracy Now! broadcasts here on PBS every night. And also on KQED, PBS, a number of times a day. You know Democracy Now! began more than 16 years ago, almost 16 years ago, as the only daily election show in public broadcasting on a few dozen community radio stations. 2001 came along the week of September 11th. We went on one TV station as emergency broadcasting. We were the closest national broadcast to Ground Zero. Once we went on the first TV stations, stations all over the country asked, can they run us? We would FedEx out the video cassettes. That's how long ago it was before we used satellites. And now, 16 years later, we're broadcasting on over 1,100 public radio and television stations. a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day. War and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to the servicemen and women of this country as we move into Veterans Day. They can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society to have the discussions that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die, whether they're sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. I believe the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, it is wielded as a weapon of war. We must challenge that. You know, Democracy Now! has been on a hundred city tour, and it's been truly amazing. Tonight I head back to New York. I'll be with Noam Chomsky and Juan Cole of the University of Michigan in Princeton, New Jersey tomorrow, and we'll bring you that broadcast later in the week. But we have been to so many remarkable places. You know, our series expanding the debate, where every time there was a presidential or vice presidential debate, we expanded it. And let me explain how. How many of you watch the series? That's wonderful to see. And by the way, you can check it out at democracynow.org. Let's begin in Denver. Remember, the first presidential debate was moderated by Jim Lehrer. It was at the University of Denver, Colorado. Denver just down the road from the Aurora massacre that had happened in a course of a decade ago from Columbine. And so the Brady campaign against gun violence, you know, named for Jim Brady, who was the press secretary of President Reagan when the attempted assassination of Reagan took place, Jim Brady was shot through the head but survived and he and his wife Sarah set up this campaign. And they led a campaign to get the presidential debate moderators to ask a question about gun violence, to get the PBS host, Jim Lehrer, for that first debate. What could be more appropriate in Colorado? So right before Colorado, we were in Virginia Tech, Blacksburg, Virginia. We were there to interview Colin Goddard, who came down from Washington. He works for the Brady Campaign. He happens to be one of the victims of the Virginia Tech massacre. Colin's an amazing young man. Uh, Maria Cuomo Cole, the New York governor's sister, made a film about him called Living for 32. You know, 32 is the number of people who died at Virginia Tech. Um, Colin was shot up four times. He came to Virginia Tech right before the first presidential debate. He took me through Norris Hall, where part of the massacre took place, the worst part of the massacre. And he told me that morning, he said that morning in 2007, 
was deciding whether to go to French class. He was with his friend in their car, and they were going to go to breakfast. French class, breakfast. French class, breakfast. It was 9 in the morning, and his conscience got the better of him, and he rolled in late. And his French professor rolled her eyes, because Colin was late as usual. But he sat down. But what surprised him is halfway through the class, the best student walked in, Rachel. He had never beaten Rachel to class. She was completely unnerved. She said there'd been a shooting in her dorm, and the authorities wouldn't let anyone out early that morning, so she had just raced over when she could. And everyone said, shooting in your dorm? What are you talking about? And then they heard the crack, crack, crack. And they thought, what is that? And they thought, maybe it's construction outside. Then it was coming closer. And Colin said, the French professor, a young woman, looked outside the door. She turned back quickly, told the students, dive under your desk. She was shot dead by the gunman. And Colin dove under his desk. He reached for his next cell phone. He said he did something he'd never done before. He called 911. He said, quick, there's a shooting at Norris Hall. Please come quickly. They said, Norris Hall where? He said, oh, Virginia Tech. They said, Virginia Tech where? He said, Blacksburg. They said, Blacksburg where? He said, Blacksburg, Virginia. Virginia, they said. He didn't know if he was calling another country, calling 911 or another state. And then he lost control of his phone. It turned out the young woman next to him was able to get a hold of the phone. And somehow they made the connection. She was able to describe what was happening as she was under her desk. And then Colin saw the shooter's legs, the uh, khaki pants, come into the classroom. And then he felt the pain in his hips and his shoulders as he was shot. And I can't say he was one of the lucky ones, because no one is lucky when you have a class of 16 and nine of the 16 people in your class are killed, the others wounded. But Colin did survive. And then right before that, I talked to Nikki Giovanni, the great poet in her office. She was amazing. She was talking about this amazing moment that she was having. Actually, it's right now in October. She was celebrating Toni Morrison because Toni just lost her son, Slade. And they wanted to just do a big event at Virginia Tech for the great writer. And she said, I'm doing it with a doc. And I said, who's the doc? She said, Dr. Maya Angelou. So Dr. Maya Angelou and Nikki Giovanni and Toni Morrison were together just recently at Virginia Tech. And she was making all the phone calls about it. I said, well, let's just talk about your art, about your poetry. And then I asked if she would talk about the shooting. She doesn't like to talk about the shooting, but she did that in the afternoon. And she said she was in San Francisco for a meeting. And just as the meeting was started, she said, I have to go home. They said, well, you just got here. And she said, I don't know. I have to go home. The massacre hadn't taken place. She didn't know why. She didn't know what drove her. She said, I have to go back home. And she went, flew back to Virginia. She's driving to Blacksburg. She sees a TV news car shoot by at 120 miles an hour. She's police at the Blacksburg exit. It won't let anyone there. And she realizes something terrible has happened. She's going to a radio. She's trying to listen. And she understands there's been a massacre. And she says, oh, my God, it must be Cho. Cho was her poetry student the shooter. Had been a poetry student a year before. She couldn't reach him. She knew he was trouble. Every red flag in the book was raised. He, in his class, she, he just wouldn't participate. He was mean. He was menacing, she said. Wore sunglasses and a hat over his face. She couldn't reach him. And she told him, you must leave my class. And he said, you can't make me. And he, she said, you're right, so I will resign my professorship. And she said it to her higher up. She said it to the department head. She said, it's either him or me. And she said, she always teaches difficult students. That's not the challenge. She, she sees that her responsibility. Autistic kids, kids with Tourette's, other problems, she said. And she's there as their professor, as their teacher. But she knew the student. She couldn't reach him. He needed help. So how is it this kid that needed so much help, who stalked young women on campus for more than a year, who'd been institutionalized, can legally get a gun? And that's the question Colin was asking, Nikki Giovanni was asking, and that's why the Brady Center got tens of thousands of signatures to get Jim Lehrer to ask the question in Colorado. No, the question wasn't asked. But we expanded the debate. Just as that debate was taking place at the University of Denver with Mitt Romney and President Obama, we were down the road at a Comcast studio. We set up our podiums like them. We set up our blue banner like they had. We had looked at the workers online that day and saw how they were setting up their facility. And we brought in the third party candidates. We brought in Dr. Jill Stein, Green Party presidential candidate. We brought in Rocky Anderson, the Justice Party presidential candidate. And we asked them, we put the questions to them that Jim Lehrer 
output to the major party candidates. He opened the debate, he welcomed people to University of Denver, and he said, I think President Obama won the coin toss. He got two minutes on the economy. When he was done, Mitt Romney got two minutes on the economy. Then we stopped the videotape, and we said, Dr. Jill Stein, you have two minutes on the economy. Uh, Rocky Anderson, two minutes on the economy. Then back to my colleague, Jim Lehrer, at the University of Denver. Well, I'll tell you something. That expanded debate raised the issue of climate change. Over and over again, Rocky Anderson and Jill Stein linked climate change, questioned war. We have to get beyond not so much the gridlock in Washington, but the bipartisan consensus in Washington. Because... debates. Did they disagree on drones? Did they ever raise the issue of climate change? Gun violence was raised not by one of the moderators, but at the Hofstra University Long Island debate, one of the people in the audience, regular people. This crosses the political spectrum. Don't forget Jim Brady, right, was... Jim Brady was President Reagan's press secretary calling for gun control in this country. Yes. This is the moment to expand the debate. Now the work of movements begins. After we hosted the expanded debate, we went to Colorado Springs, heavily militarized city in this country, home to Fort Carson, home to NORAD, home to the Air Force Academy on the eve of the 11th anniversary of the longest war in the U.S., Afghanistan. And we had on David Phillips, who was nominated for a Pulitzer for his series called Lethal Warrior, which he turned into a book, which is the unit that went to Iraq, they named themselves Lethal Warrior, they went to Iraq, came back, went to Iraq, came back at Fort Carson, they just kept on killing. It means that the New York Times has to write the words, well, the silence majority stories of uprisings, occupations, resistance, and hope in the pages of the New York Times. I just think it's interesting to see those words together in the Times. Uprisings, occupations, resistance, and hope. Um, and also, when a book like this gets on the New York Times bestseller list, what it says to publishers, they see it as a market, we see it as a citizenry and a non-citizenry. People who are interested in independent voices, that's why it's so important to get on these lists. Because it says to publishers, maybe you, maybe you, maybe you want to write a book. And they say, maybe there is a market for these kind of books. I do believe that media can change the world, that books, that independent bookstores are so important, like libraries, like independent radio and TV stations. They provide a roadmap to a whole other universe. And who is that universe populated by? Well, that goes to the title. Because I really do think that those who are concerned about war, those who are concerned about the growing inequality in this country, those who are concerned about climate change, the raging storms on the East Coast, the dust bowl conditions of the Midwest, the fires in California and Colorado, the fate of the planet, those who are concerned about all these issues are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. So, after we were in Colorado Springs, we went back to Denver because I was invited on Al Jazeera English to debate David Weston, the former president of ABC World News Tonight, about the media's coverage of war and elections. David Weston was in New York studio. I was in the PBS NewsHour studios in Denver. And Shahab, the moderator, was, I think, in Washington. And we talked about the elections, and I talked about our expanding the debate, and David Weston said that he felt they asked the right questions and probing questions, uh, the media did. And then he said the same with war, and I said I beg to differ. And I went back to 2003. I used this example because I wanted to talk about his own org news organization. Uh, 2003, when General Colin Powell was Secretary of State, February 5th, 2003, the day he gave his push for war at the UN. You may remember this. 
and if you don't, you should read about it. He had dragged his feet on war, but this day he said the evidence was in. Saddam Hussein was an imminent threat to the United States. This was the nail in the coffin for so many. And so FAIR, the group Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting, FAIR.org, did a study of the four major nightly newscasts in that two weeks around Colin Powell giving his push for war at the UN. This was six weeks before the invasion, half the population opposed to war. It's what Noam Chomsky, who I'm going to see tomorrow at Princeton, what Noam Chomsky calls, well, the media manufacturing consent, manufacturing consent for war.